Hello everyone and welcome to the MetaVance webinar series hosted by MetaVance Billing Service. Today's webinar is Joint Commission Accreditation. There's a consultant for that. Now we have a great presentation in store for you, but before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Now we've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. Now you've joined this presentation using listening on your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Now we've put all the lines on mute to reduce any background noise. If you have any concerns with audio or visual, please message me through the chat window located to the right of your screen. Now you will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. And you may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Now you will be receiving a copy of today's presentation and a link to review the recorded webinar in two to three days. Now it is now my pleasure to introduce to you Bridget and Casey Hetty of BLH Psych Services. Bridget and Casey. Hello, how are you? Good afternoon everyone and thank you for attending. Uh, welcome to our webinar. We're just getting us set up right here on our slideshow. So uh, we will be discussing Joint Commission accreditation. There's a consultant for that. My name is Bridget Hetty and I am a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Florida and CEO and founder of BLH Psych Services. Our primary focus is working with organizations to achieve and maintain accreditation through the Joint Commission. Good morning, my name is Casey Hetty. I'm the COO of BLH Psych Services. Uh, so in addition to some other areas uh, as well, I focus primarily on the life safety, environment of care, and emergency management with an emphasis on fire and building code compliance. So here's uh, the agenda we'll be covering for today. What is a joint commission? And what are the benefits of accreditation? What are the necessary steps to getting accredited and using a consultant? We're going to go through some uh, consultation beware and what a consultant can do for you and why VLA Psych Services is unique. So we'll start with Joint Commission. What is the Joint Commission? The Joint Commission is an independent and not-for-profit organization. Uh, they were founded in 1951 as a medically-based model, and in 1969, the Joint Commission expanded its services to include the behavioral health field. Uh, they've been considered the, uh, the Joint Commission's gold seal of accreditation as a nationally recognized symbol of quality and excellence. So here's some some words that you want your organization to be described as. Um, by achieving accreditation by the Joint Commission, it says that your organization is committed to providing the highest quality of care in the safest environment possible. All right, what are the necessary steps to accreditation? Joint Commission has a process of steps that they recommend to follow in order to achieve accreditation. The first step here is reviewing your current policies and procedures to ensure the policies are congruent with what your organization is actually doing. Once that reviewing process is completed, you will then review the Comprehensive Behavioral Health Care Manual provided by the Joint Commission. The Comprehensive Behavioral Health Care Manual consists of 14 separate sections. We will discuss those sections further in detail in a few moments. At this time that you have then collaborated your current policy and procedures and the comprehensive behavioral health care manual standards, um, you will then begin collaborating and creating new policies and procedures for your organization. From that step, we're going to then go into the implementation of those standards. So looking at your current policies and procedures and the comprehensive behavioral health care manual, you will then create those new standards, in turn then begin implementing those standards. Uh, there may be policies and procedures that need to be changed, added completely, or reworked 
within that organization of training your staff on new um, standards and implementation. The implementation process does consist of training all of your staff members and working on any documentations needed. Once the implementation process begins, the application process would then start. The application process does ask for average daily census, the type of facility, the services that are provided, the location of the facility, or any other housing and specifically a survey date in which you would like your on-site survey to occur. Based on your location of housing in comparison to your treatment centers as well as the number of facilities, the number of clients, and different programs provided, will determine your overall number of days for your on-site survey. Joint Commission does have annual fees as well as your on-site survey fee. The on-site survey fee is normally comprised of a number of days at your organization. The Joint Commission does break up these fees into a three-year period. The first year you normally pay 60% of the total fees, which include your annual fee and on-site survey, and then the subsequent 20% on your second year, and then 20% on your third year. There are approximately 35 to 40 behavioral health care surveyors that are working for the Joint Commission at this time, uh, so you may receive a uh, Joint Commission surveyor um, you know, from many different states that are not specific to your state. The on-site survey typically lasts anywhere between two and six days. Again, this is an average varying on multiple factors such as your programs, uh, such as the programs that your organization provides, the number of clients that you may have, and the numbers of facilities or if you have any housing. During the on-site survey, the surveyors will be reviewing all areas within the behavioral health care manual and speak with all staff members as well as clients within your organization. After each day is com completed with the surveyor, a closing meeting will be provided for information on any deficiencies that were found. A corrective action plan will be provided after the on-site survey is completed in its entirety. So we do see a corrective action plan occurring right after your on-site survey normally takes anywhere between um, four and ten days for it to be added to your extranet system. Uh, the corrective action plans will be placed on that system and you will complete that through their website. Corrective action plans typically have a 45 or 60 day time frame depending on the type of deficiency to get the actions completed and submitted. Once the corrective action plan is submitted, they will review your information and determine accreditation. So we're going to go into a few of the behavioral health care standards. So these are the 14 sections within the Behavioral Health Care Manual from the Joint Commission. We will provide a quick overview of each section so you're familiar with the extensive information needed in achieving the accreditation from Joint Commission. One of the major points that we want to explain to you guys is that the Joint Commission focuses on all areas of your organization in order to achieve consistency and safety through towards everyone within your organization. Many of the sections will intertwine with each other uh, while reviewing for specific codes. So for example, within, uh, let's just take for example, within infection control, you're going to see certain areas uh, such as the standard on a flu vaccination of all staff members. Their current uh, information is that you need to maintain 90% of your staff has to have the flu vaccine by 2020. Again, standards change, but at this time, this is the requirement. Uh, within infection control is where that standard would, would be placed. We also need to understand that they intertwine in other sections, such as information needs to be analyzed for data within your performance improvement sections as well as that information of whether or not your staff member has received the flu vaccine needs to also be placed in that particular person's staff HR file. So in one particular standard, it may hit into three other sections. So let's start with the care treatment and service. Uh, this section in collaboration with the record of care discusses the 
entire contents of your client's medical record. Uh, that has to do with some pre-screening, uh, your intake process, all of the financials, any liability waivers, your treatment plans or progress notes that are completed within your organization, the medications if you are prescribing or self-administering, uh, so on and so forth, with medications within the organization, any discharge paperwork, and so on and so forth. Um, your on-site survey does consist approximately of 60% of your documentation within your client's record from your therapist, physicians, and then they do discuss that record as well um, with your clients. So we're going to go into the rights of the individual. Uh, rights of the individual focuses on the responsibilities and the rights of the client that they have while being in, the, in your organization. There are specific areas in which Joint Commission indicates are important to inform the client of what uh, they will be provided within your organization and the responsibilities that the client has uh, while they are being held um, in your organization. Some of the uh, areas that Joint Commission mandates is providing an oral hygiene program if you have a 24-hour care setting. So those are types of things that your organization would need to provide. Again, it will vary based on organization, on uh, the types of services that you're going to provide, but there will need to be some sort of an oral, oral hygiene program for any dental care. So they get into many, many specifics in each section. Again, that is just one example. Within your medication management, uh, this applies to any organization who is prescribing, administering, self-administering, storing, and dispensing any medications. Uh, there are specific standards that go along with these types of medication management programs. Uh, we won't get into all of them, but just understanding that there are multiple uh, sections within just one standard. Um, Information management does focus on your computer systems, such as any electronic medical records or paper records. These standards discuss the setup and privacy of those records and how to maintain confidentiality. This section also discusses how to maintain operation during the time of schedule and unscheduled interruptions, as well as any retention of records. Again, that will be based on a state mandate, so depending on um, if you're in the state of Florida, California, there are different mandates within the states uh, on retention of records here in South Florida or in Florida. Uh, we have a record of retention for seven years. Um, all right. Wave testing applies only to organizations that are utilizing a pregnancy or urine test that provide immediate results. So many of you understand that as point of care cups. Um, the organization providing this type of testing will need a CLIA certificate for all locations that that is being provided. Again, this will only apply to organizations who are utilizing a pregnancy or point of care cups. Um, Human resources is comprised of some specific areas that the Joint Commission would like all staff to be knowledgeable on, such as trainings in trauma, exploitation, neglect, abuse. Again, there are many others, but those are just examples. Joint Commission also mandates that employees are competent for the job description that they are hired for. Competency evaluations are a major aspect of Joint Commission, so they're heavily focusing on that particular area. Uh, we'll talk about a lot of this later with the organization and how, to, how it structures and organizes your facility, uh, but for right now, leadership refers to the organization's governance. Uh, they focus heavily on the entire organization's structure and protocol. Joint Commission wants to have a structured organization from the top down to ensure quality and safety. Infection control focuses on prioritizing risks for infection and how to minimize and maintain those risks for staff and clients. Performance improvement focuses on the data collected in order to reduce risks and liability. This will establish information on areas that will or might be going to higher risk and creating plans to decrease those risks. 
The national patient safety goals are four specific sections or specific standards that focus on safety. One of them is labeling the containers that we're going to be utilizing for urine, any point of care cups or any cups that are sent out to labs. Uh, we need to label those with names, date of birth, time, and um, date, as well as the staff needs to verify two, two identifiers of the client. So we need to make sure that um, we are identifying that client. Many people are utilizing their electronic medical record system to do that by seeing uh, a picture that they have a photograph on their EMR system. They're cross-referencing that the person's name and date of birth are correct on the um, written point of care cup or lab cup that's sending out as well as, you know, identifying them on their computer system and verifying their picture and their first name, last name, date of birth. The second national patient safety goal is the suicide risk assessments. They want to make sure that these are being completed specifically upon admission and then, excuse me, specific criteria needing to be met. So depending on your organization, many people are utilizing a suicide risk assessment uh, upon discharge as well. The third one is hand hygiene. Uh, they do require specific codes for those utilizing any physical care. Um, many facilities are utilizing, uh, their doctors are doing physical exams, uh, so they do have to have high hand hygiene compliance. The fourth and last patient safety goal are medication management area. This one, uh, among other standards, is an area for providing clients with prescription medications that they are providing a client with the information of that specific medication. So we will be providing them uh, handouts or sheets of information that include the name, the frequency, the dose, the route, the purpose, um, the side effects and risks of those medications that they are taking. Uh, anytime a, a medication is prescribed in your facility, uh, by your physician, that information would need to be provided to your clients. Again, these are areas to reduce risk and safety. So I'm going to hand this over back to Casey so he can discuss the life safety, environment of care, and emergency management sections. So life safety um, is a very detailed and comprehensive um, section that primarily focuses on any 24-hour care facilities, uh, would be, you know, your residential housing. Um, life safety does not apply to your treatment facility or uh, corporate offices. So um, what life safety really does, it, it's highly, you know, safety structure. So it goes into different types of safety equipment that needs to be present in your houses, um, smoke detectors, fire extinguishers, um, how, to, how to log the checks of these types of things. You have to have uh, emergency lighting, illuminated exit signs for a path of egress, uh, fire drills you know, on certain intervals. So all of these different things that need to be logged throughout the homes, uh, it goes through how to log them, um, you know, what needs to be placed where. Uh, it goes over a lot of uh, the different supervisory systems that a facility may have. If they have uh, a backup generator to provide backup power, uh, how they go about managing and testing that battery power, um, how they basically go about managing any kind of risks or hazards that could be present within that house. Uh, again, since it does primarily focus on you know the residential 24-hour care facilities, it's much more detailed than environment of care. Obviously, there's a lot more risk. Um, it goes into uh, chemical management. So, for instance, you know, this is a facility where, where your patients are living. There's Windex, there's bleach, there's every different type of chemical that you may have and find in your own homes. So this goes to how to manage that, how to store them. Um, you know, we make different suggestions upon that as well as to how to proper, properly safe, safely administer those to, to your clients so they can still use them with as much uh, as little risk as possible. So now going into environment of care, Again, life safety and environment of care do have a lot of similarities in the fact that they're they're primarily focused on safety. Uh, fire concern is a huge, huge concern of Joint Commission, and they want to make sure that you have a very detailed uh, fire plan to reduce the risk of fire, to be able to respond to fire and uh, and deal with any matters from that. 
So environment of care, again, like I said, very, very similar to life safety, just not as detailed. Uh, it goes over your offices, your treatment facility, and just kind of extends from where life safety stops. So now emergency management is exactly what it sounds like. It is pretty much a an entire action as to how you respond to to any type of emergency and how you manage your your business during an emergency and after. So for instance, your disaster response plan. You know, this is a big plan that the organization will agree on certain actions, how you respond in the event of a tornado. It covers every manner of disaster you can think of, uh, earthquake, tornado, hurricane, um, you know, any kind of threat on your buildings that may take place. Um, how you respond if you have to evacuate your 24-hour care facility. That whole plan is very detailed. Where do you go? Do you provide treatment? Where do you provide treatment? If you are, uh, if, if there's no power, you know, where we're at in, you know, say Palm Beach County, if there's no power in Palm Beach County, your plan has to detail how you're going to go about restocking your medicines, how you're going to restock supplies everywhere from water to, you know, toiletries that they may be using. Um, and then also your flow of communication within your organization. Who contacts who? How does that flow of communication go? Do you have a primary, secondary, and a third means of communicating? if uh, the first two should fail. Um, so it goes very detailed into, uh, into response and preparedness for, um, for any kind of emergencies. Also, uh, within that policy, it goes over if you don't have the ability to evacuate, a tornado would probably be the most likely of events where you couldn't evacuate. You have to have a, a shelter in place policy. So where in your facility, uh, whether it be a 24-hour care setting or whether it be in your uh, your treatment facility, you need to have an office that's properly, um, that meets the requirements that would be a, a shelter in place room so they can just hide in that room until the emergency passed. Um, so we'll turn it back over to Bridget to continue the slide. All right, all of these sections, of course, based on their comprehensive behavioral health care uh, manual, need to be reviewed, created, maintained and implemented within the organization. So all of the information that we had spoke about earlier about the necessary steps, these are the standards within Joint Commission, again, very comprehensive uh, in which are areas that they want to make sure that your policies and procedures and organizational standards are completed for Joint Commission accreditation. All right, so we're going to go into the benefits of accreditation. Why are organizations right now getting accredited? So we spoke about the 14 sections of the Behavioral Health Care Manual. Oops, sorry about that. It's going ahead of me. Uh, we spoke about the 14 sections of the Behavioral Health Care Manual, and these standards are meant to structure and organize your organization. Uh, Continuity and consistency within an organization is completed by achieving Joint Commission accreditation. We often speak to organizations many times that have multiple people doing the same job. So we go into a lot, a lot of times we'll go into organizations and we'll say, you know, who does the HR section or who is doing HR in this organization? And many times they'll say, uh, well, I do it or, you know, the secretary does it or somebody else is doing it. And we go in and make sure that there is structure within that organization. We want to make sure that each person has a specific job in order to achieve that task at hand. So we want to make sure that the entire organization is structured. Um, there's no more of people saying, well, I do it, or sometimes she does it, or sometimes I do it. Uh, we get things structured and organized because the continuity and consistency of those things happening will allow your organization to flourish. Um, another benefit of accreditation is the reduction, sorry again, uh, this, the reduction in risk factors. Um, so Joint Commission, uh, once accreditation is received, we do see that there is a benefit in reducing the risk of error. This occurs utilizing that performance improvement section. We do know that the collection of data uh, allows us to understand where areas are deficient in our programs and working to correct those errors. 
achieving accreditation may provide a reduction of liability insurance coverage costs uh, because they do understand that they may be a reduced risk of error. Uh, so again, it will be determined on the liability insurance company that you are working with, but there are multiple insurance companies right now that are reducing that liability coverage cost uh, due to seeing the accreditation of approval from Joint Commission on your organization. All right, so a specific benefit to accreditation is a lot of times how other people view your organization. Uh, when competing for clients or staff, your organization tends to have a competitive advantage over another organization who's not accredited. Um, your organization will also become more desirable for staff. Uh, we know, and as a, as a licensed mental health counselor, uh, Clinicians do look to organizations who are accredited because they understand the organization that they're going into. Um, they understand that an organization that's accredited might be providing more structure. They may be achieving more ethical standards towards their staff or towards their clients. Um, so a lot of times that staff that you are gaining to your organization is uh, on a higher level, uh, prides themselves on those types of um, ethical basis and joint commission accreditation can do that for you. Uh, we do see that because you will be functioning at a higher quality level of your organization. We also see very frequently the reassurance uh, factor from clients and family. Uh, Reassurance will be one way a client and or their family member uh, will feel when they, when they see a gold seal of accreditation. They understand that the quality that is provided from an organization when, when joint commission is very different from an organization that is not accredited. We don't say that facilities that are not accredited do not do good jobs. We know that they do, uh, but we also know that we're, it's, it's a question mark. We're not sure what type of organization they are. Um, we often say that, you know, we see nice websites out there. People talk about it all the time. You see a really nice website with the beach in Florida and California, and they all look good. Uh, but where people are noticing, families are noticing, clients are noticing um, that joint commission accreditation, people who are seeing that seal on there, are it is becoming more apparent and they're understanding more that it's not just about you know a picture on a website, that it's actually about the standards and the quality and care that they're going to receive there. Uh, parents make decisions on sending their kids to centers and accreditation from the Joint Commission does provide a, a parent with the reassurance that their child will be safe and will be getting quality care. So it's a massive benefit for many of these organizations going through and getting accredited specifically with all of the um, the downsides of you know treatment centers that we've seen uh, in the last couple of years. All right, one of the wonderful topics that everybody likes to talk about is the re the insurance reimbursements um, and why these are a benefit of receiving joint commission accreditation is um, it's a major benefit right now. Most organizations are not getting insurance reimbursements due to higher levels of, for higher levels of care with certain insurance companies. Um, at this time, you're seeing Aetna, GHI, Assurant, and Value Options with United Healthcare. They're currently not accepting organizations on their panel or paying for higher levels of care without accreditation from the Joint Commission. So let me explain to you a little bit about higher levels of care. Many of you may know this already, uh, but higher levels of care within the insurance company are, is care provided for um, residential treatment centers or inpatient treatment centers. Um, there are many other areas that they may not allow for insurance reimbursement, but at this time it is specific for higher levels of care. Insurance companies are aligning themselves with the Joint Commission to ensure proper services and safe practices are being completed by an organization. Um, 
due to all of the insurance companies not being able to go and physically see each individual organization, um, what's happening is that they are placing joint commission accreditation. Uh, they're understanding that once a facility is accredited, they're noticing that from that, they will see that um, they're providing a standard and a service that is, you know, legal, ethical, and that is, you know, they're noticing in that aspect, so they are reimbursing for those services. Um, it also shows that, you know, Joint Commission also shows the, that re reduction of risk, so it's less of a risk for the insurance companies as well. We, of course, anticipate that other insurance companies are going to follow suit and mandate joint commission accreditation for providing reimbursement over the next year. Again, at this time, these are the four major players out there right now that are doing this on the higher levels of care, but we 100% see a lot more insurance companies going forward with this. Um, we do see this because they are a medical model. Joint Commission has um, been doing this for quite some time, and with them being a medically based model, the insurance companies are defaulting to Joint Commission. So we are seeing this, you know, exponentially become greater within our field. Uh, on the bottom there, you see Medicaid and Medicare advantages. There are some advantages for receiving accreditation if you are possibly looking to become a member of Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, if you become, are looking to become a provider, you can qualify for some Medicaid and Medicare uh, certification without undergoing a separate government quality inspection. Uh, so this eases the burden of multiple surveys occurring, uh, you know, in order to get on panels or to get other services. We are also... Um, in the state of Florida, again, I don't know if many of you are out of state as well, but in the state of Florida here, uh, Department of Children and Family, or DCF, uh, once accredited by Joint Commission, they do not do their surveys annually. They do their surveys every three years, as well as Joint Commission does their surveys every three years as well. So, again, another benefit to Joint Commission. All right. We're going to go into uh, using a consultant. Uh, these are some steps that we go through. So this is our step-by-step -step process. Uh, many times when utilizing a consultant, again, when we spoke earlier about the necessary steps to receiving accreditation, uh, we have our own step-by-step -step process that we utilize, so we want to go into the in-depth with our process and um, in achieving accreditation. So the first step that we go into is self-assessment of the organization. So what we do first is we go into your organization, determine what types of uh, standards actually apply to your organization, whether or not you're a 24-hour care facility, whether or not you are prescribing um, methadone, depending on, you know, if you're prescribing methadone, you are then considered an opioid treatment program. So we will go in and self-assess all of the uh, types of uh, standards that apply to your organization. We compile all of your standards and then go in um, to determine, you know, where you are deficient. So from our self-assessment of all of your steps, we then go in and review all of your policies and procedures, medical records, um, and all of those areas for deficiencies. So we'll look to see if, for example, let's just say there are 600 standards within the Joint Commission, uh, we do determine uh, how many standards, we do uh, an analysis of how many standards you guys are, the organization is deficient by. Based on that, we will then go in and, you know, go to our uh, subsequent steps. So I will, I focus on all of the um, policies and procedures, medical records, those types of areas. Casey will speak now on the inspection of building codes in the deficiencies in that area. So just as we go through your policy procedure manual to make sure that uh, you are doing certain things or find out what you're not doing policy and procedure wise, the same things need to be done in the physical building environment. So if you have 24-hour care facilities or even your uh, treatment facilities, 
are going to need to be equipped with certain things, like I discussed earlier in the life safety and uh, environment of care sections. Um, so we go through, walk through every property that the facility owns. Uh, I walk through with whatever staff has been delegated to oversee that your VHTs, uh, whatever contractors uh, to install emergency lighting, install exit signs, make sure that the fire extinguishers are where they need to be, that they are uh, that they are kept up maintenance-wise. Fire extinguishers need to be checked on intervals and make sure that they um, they're always hung. So we'll go through that process, make sure that they're, make sure I understand what type of systems they may have and what type of deficiencies they have. Um, a lot of times I've seen our clients don't necessarily know what type of uh, supervisory systems or fire systems they have within a building because they share it with other, uh, other tenants and usually the landlord does those types of things. Well now you need to be responsible for overseeing that. If there are systems and safety systems in place in your business, then you need to be aware of that and uh, are responsible for logging those. So that's where that inspection process really sheds a lot of light on what they have because organizations may not know. Okay, adding from, from the next step on step four, we're going to assist in the application process. Um, of course, we are going to uh, figure out based on all of the self-assessment, our reviewing of policies and procedures, and Casey's uh, inspection within your building codes or your buildings and treatment center and uh, housing, we'll determine based on that time where what is deficient specifically and how long we find that those deficiencies are going to take. Upon application, as we had explained earlier, um, within the necessary steps, is that we do have to provide joint commission with a survey date. So we will provide that, again, based on our deficient, uh, all of the deficiencies reviewed prior to that. Our next step, our step five, is that we do come in and we meet with organization leaders to modify those positions and establish structure. So we spoke about the benefits of it earlier, about how structuring your organization will, will exponentially enhance your organization. We will go in and work with your leaders in order to understand and structure your organization. So this is a major area to understand who is doing what and who, it, you know, just the um, overall organization structure. Okay, our next step is step six of us coming into organization. After we have met and uh, delegated those positions and figured out where everybody is structurally, uh, we do meet with each department staff member to modify and or create the policies and procedures. So based on the deficiencies that we had seen and joint commission standards, we will go in and assist in that process of either creating those policies with your staff members um, or you know modifying those policies that you already have. Uh, we're gonna go into later a little bit about those uh, pre-made manuals. That is not something that we do. We work hand in hand with all of your staff members in order to do those policies and procedures. Our step seven is that we now implement all of those areas. Casey is gonna speak about the implementation and his portion uh, of safety standards. So just like I mentioned a little bit before, you know, when we go through the physical environment to determine what needs to be done, uh, oftentimes there's a uh, need to have a, a you know, certified electrician or licensed electrician or contractor come in and do those types of things properly. They you know, involve wiring throughout the home. So that's where we'll go and, and make sure that the, I will again, re, uh, re confirm with the contractor that they're installing them the right way, the way that they're, you know, the lights are pointed the right direction, the exit signs are illuminating the right exits. Uh, we'll go through uh, any types of training that now the staff is required to do. So when you, you, know, you put new exit signs in, well, they're battery powered, so now they're responsible for testing those. And we'll train the staff on um, how those need to be tested. We'll provide the logs that they need to do. Uh, if they're not already monitoring their uh, refrigerator temperature daily, we'll go through, again, that's all the logs that need to be done. We provide the logs, provide the training on how the logs need to be completed, the intervals, um, and then we'll discuss any safety equipment that needs to be uh, completed in the house. 
Our next step is that we go in and we do, Casey was speaking about training your staff members, and that's an area that we do focus on heavily. We do train all the staff leaders uh, on all of the policies and procedures and maintenance uh, areas that need to occur within the organization. So we will work with every single person on your organizational staff, many times, whether it be individually, with all therapists, all of your behavioral health technicians, um, or in groups in order to maintain and make sure that all those policies and procedures are set up and all of your staff is aware and trained in those areas prior to joint commission coming for their survey. We then as well do all mock tracers. So again, same thing with the training, but we will sit down. We have a, um, a setup of all questions that we ask for, um, that we ask for mock tracers and we go through those questions so that all of your staff members are up to date with Joint Commission uh, when they get there. Last and not least, uh, we do, uh, we are on site during accreditation surveys as needed, uh, of course, with assistance with the com completion of any corrective action plans like we were talking about earlier. So this is, I want to go over some things to be aware of. This is our consultation beware section. The first thing and the, one of the biggest things is the use of pre-made manuals. Uh, this boilerplate approach uh, that sometimes is seen out there, basically it's going to make you do all the work. Um, you know, what a pre-made manual is going to end up having you do is you're either going to have to change everything that you do within that manual and with your organization to fit the wording in that manual or you're going to have to rewrite the manual anyway to fit what you're doing. Um, the best and most beneficial way to doing this is to have a customizable set of policy procedures that doesn't necessarily just add to things but it, we don't want to change what you're already doing in, in, to be compliant with other organizations. We want to be able to add to it so you're not changing things you need to be doing in other areas but you're also adding to the Joint Commission uh, policy procedures. The biggest analogy I like to use is if on day one of going to college they handed you all your books and said, we'll see you in four years when you're ready to take the exam, I don't know very many people would pass and get their degrees. Well, this is the same thing. Um, you need the education that goes along with the policies and procedures, and that's, that's what we do. Uh, you need to be able to understand what they mean and how they mean. Uh, Joint Commission is very specific as to the things they want you to do, but they give you leeway as to how you execute them, uh, what decisions you make and what way you go about them. So that's where having that customizable approach is beneficial. Uh, number two, having uh, someone who's exclusively remote, um, that is going to result in basically them being absent. Um, your facility has a lot of intricacies to it, and there's no way that someone could possibly know all they need to know about your facility and organization by being remote. Um, I say that specifically coming from the side of uh, looking at the houses and inspecting your facility. How do you do that remotely? You're going to be faced with a lot of questions that you don't know the answers to, um, and not having somebody available at your disposal is going to be a very difficult task in managing and understanding what these policies and procedures actually mean and how to carry them out effectively to where you're realistically going to get them done right. Last thing is uh, limit and, and access, limits and access. This project should be looked at as its entirety. When we put proposals to our clients, um, it's for the entire job. We don't bill by hour. We don't limit the amount of time we will or won't spend with a client. Um, that's just not effective to get the job done. Um, again, you're faced with a lot of questions, a lot of demands that you don't know. Um, we spend the amount of time with a client that we need to. Uh, if we need to spend uh, every day at their office, we do. If we need to go once a week, then that's what the time demands. But um, you need to have someone who's available to you to get the job done as questions come up. So the next slide is uh, what a consultant cannot do. So basically, we need your help. We need help from you to carry out the suggestions and things that we ask to implement. Um, the best uh, example of that is the disaster plan. There's a lot in that disaster plan that I can't write for you because there's a lot that you need to decide what's the best way to go about this. Uh, what hotel do you want to stay at? What facility do you want to move to? You know, these are things that 
you know, you need to decide the flow of communication to your organization. So we'll come in and tell you what needs to be done, what needs to be added. Uh, but there are a lot of things that we need cooperation from our clients uh, to be timely. Uh, all of the responses that we need from them need to be in a timely manner so that way we don't slow down the process. Um, so again, we need your help. All right, so why BLH Psych Services? Uh, we pride ourselves on having a very different model. We like to say that we are a partnership with your organization. We have a hands-on approach in which we want to work with each staff member in creating and implementing policies and training all of your staff. We are experts in the Behavioral Health Care Manual from the Joint Commission and understand all specific policies and procedures that are needed. By being experts in the standards, we provide a much more structured and efficient process. As I discussed earlier, I'm a licensed mental health counselor and know firsthand about the behavioral health care industry. All of our staff members are licensed clinicians. Casey is our business and building professional with his extensive knowledge of building and fire codes, allows our organization to have all areas within one consulting company. Lastly, we work with organizations to decrease that time frame it takes to achieve accreditation. Of course, as Casey previously previously stated, we do not need we do, we need your help <laughs> by reducing the time frame on um, receiving accreditation based on your organization's responsiveness. We typically get our organizations accredited anywhere between six and nine months. On average, organizations not utilizing a consultant will typically take anywhere between ten and fourteen months due to the extensive information and the interpretation of the standards, pulling employees from their current job duties in order to take on those Joint Commission standards. So one of the things that we just also want to give you guys a little bit of information on is that we do provide Joint Commission post-accreditation services. Uh, the Joint Commission generally does complete a survey every three years after the initial accreditation. We also work with organizations that have achieved accreditation and are in the maintenance phase to ensure accreditation upon approval or renewal. We provide services on a monthly or quarterly basis in order to maintain current standards. We work hand in hand with, any, with all organizations by updating all new policies and procedures due to the constant changes in standards. Joint Commission tends to change their standards anywhere between two and three times a year. So we do review the organization's daily, monthly, and annual compliance, mandatory documentation, and we ensure that the organization is in continuous compliance for a successful renewal of accreditation. So we do want to thank you all for being here and attending our webinar today. Again, I am Bridget Hetty, uh, CEO of BLH Psych Services, Casey Hetty, COO of BLH Psych Services, and if you have any questions, please feel free. I think Lakeisha is going to... Um, give us some questions here to answer for you, but our contact information is here. We'd like to hear from you. Okay, thank you, Bridget and Casey. Um, it does look like we have a few questions. Um, let's see. Um, from Ira, a colleague of mine contacted Jayco for a consultant to achieve accreditation for his facility. They recommended a person for him to call. Um, are you one of the recommended consultants from Jayco? Yes, we are. There, um, there are a few consultants on their list as well, but we are, um, if they have spoken with Peggy Lavin of the Joint Commission, she does send out our contact information for, um, as a referral source for Joint Commission. We are one of the recommended providers on there. Okay, we have another question. Um, what is the cost from the Joint Commission for the three years? Um, how much is your cost? Um, our core, our cost as consultants varies depending on the organization, uh, depends on what type of facility they are. So again, that might be something that we would need to speak more intimately about with the organization that's looking for accreditation or consulting, consultive services. Uh, Joint Commission's cost, de again, depends on the organization. So uh, if it's a very small agency, 
uh, you know, IOP, OP program, depending on what type of organization. Those are usually about $1,800 annually each year are the fees, and then it will vary on how many locations you have, uh, how many treatment centers, depending on how many days that they do come out. So their fees do change. Again, they change normally every year. Uh, right now, I believe for a small organization, it's um, about $1,800 in costs for an annual fee. But again, um, your on-site survey could be anywhere up to six days, and all of those costs that go into the survey are flying here, their hotel stay, all of their um, needs, as well as you know travel needs will be added onto your on-site survey costs. So again, something that would need to go through joint commission, depending on the size of the organization. And just to elaborate a little bit on, on our costs, um, again, the number of beds, the type of treatment you provide, uh, all things that are, are customized into the uh, proposal. Um, so it's hard to just throw out you know, a, re a regular number. Every facility is different and does different things. Um, anyone who has any questions on cost, we'd be happy to discuss you know, their specific uh, details. Uh, and we put a free consultation together uh, and, and walk through those costs with anyone who has any questions on them. Okay, awesome. It looks like those were um, the only questions that we have today, right now. Um, so we just want to thank you, Bridget and Casey. Thank you guys so much for, and thank everyone else for attending the Medivance uh, webinar series hosted by Medivance Billing Service. And BLH Psych Services actually has something special for all of you attending right now. They have a giveaway. They're giving away five free passes to the Moments of Change conference happening September 28th through October 1st. And the Moments of Change conference is going to be at the beautiful Breakers Hotel in Palm Beach, Florida. And the the Moments of Change Conference, it's hosted by Foundations Recovery Network. So um, in order to receive the five free passes that BLH Psych Services is giving away, um, they're going to take the first five callers who contact them to learn a little bit more about their services. And their contact phone number is 1-800-433-4379. It's right there on your screen. Right there again, that number is one 800 433 4379. And again, this is for the first five callers who contacts BLH Psych Services. And this is for five free passes to the Moments of Change conference that's going to take place at the Breakers Hotel in Palm Beach, Florida. So, I, oh, go ahead. I apologize. We have the wrong number on there. Oh, Actually, okay. funny as that might sound, they it switched the 43. It's 433-3479. Ah, three, four. No problem. So, okay, it's again, it's 1-800- 433-3479. I'm going to send that to all you guys. 1-800-433-3479. Okay, now um, thank you guys so much, Bridget and Casey. And again, once you leave today's webinar, you are going to be receiving a survey on the presentation. And we would appreciate it if you would complete the survey and just provide us your feedback. You're also going to receive a follow-up email within 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar, Joint Commission Accreditation. There's a consultant for that. So on behalf of the Joint Commission, on behalf of BLH Psych Services, Medivance Billing Service, and our pre presenters today, we want to thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.